Kremlinology is back. Russia projects an image of control, the ultimate vertical power structure. But who's really pulling the strings? The Putin system of power, uh, the so-called uh, power vertical, is much more uh, like a, a Byzantium court than a, a system of kind of totalitarian dictatorship where the leader dictates to uh, his subordinates. But rather, Putin has always played the role of a kind of a power broker between the different groupings around the Kremlin that all vowed for power. When we talk about the Kremlin, what we're really talking about is a patchwork of factions with Putin at its centre. One way of dividing the clans is between the powerful security services, known as the Siloviki on the one hand, and a loose grouping of elites on the other, including technocrats and Putin loyalists. Both sides have their own politicians and oligarchs. The system functions thanks to a fragile balance of power. Tensions between the factions can have deadly consequences. The killing of Boris Nemtsov is a case in point. The prominent opposition politician was shot dead in 2015, gunned down right in front of the Kremlin. Five Chechens were convicted of the killing, but who gave the order? In the West, many blamed Putin himself, but in Russia, Nemtsov's supporters believe he was killed because of an internal battle within the security establishment involving the FSB and the Chechen leader, Ramzan Kadyrov. Even many of Boris Nemtsov's supporters and Vladimir Putin's harshest critics believe that the Russian president didn't know about the murder until after it happened. And interestingly, just a few days after the killing, Putin disappeared from public view for more than a week. The assumption was he was trying to restore order amongst the clans. Let's go back to our map of Kremlin influence. The elites can be further subdivided into two groups, the liberal reformists and those who favour stronger state control of the economy. The security services can also be divided into camps, the FSB and other rivals like the Interior Ministry and military and foreign intelligence. The Kremlin's factions are in flux. Conflicts are usually played out behind closed doors, but occasionally they break out into the open. Late last year, Alexei Ulyukhaev, Putin's former economy minister, was sentenced to eight years in a penal colony. The case hinged on a sting operation by the security services involving Igor Sechin, a close confidant of Putin, CEO of the Russian oil giant Rosneft, and one of the most powerful men in Russia. In a country where institutions are weak, the Kremlin's clans cluster around individuals. Igor Sechin is widely regarded as a leader of the Siloviki, or one of them, and also as an advocate of greater state control. The jailed economy minister belonged to the liberal reformists. His conviction was a victory for the statists. The idea of Putin's uh, power is that he himself controls only uh, some sectors of, uh, of power, of what he wants to be to be manageable and of course it's law enforcement structures it's energy sector foreign policy military and industrial complex that's it and so to salisbury if we assume that russia was behind the attack on the skripals in some form that leaves two possibilities either putin ordered or approved the operation or he didn't and if he didn't then was it part of the ongoing battle for power between the clans? There could be a scenario in which the uh, one of the uh, security services that are fighting with another part of the security services um, are interested to see uh, uh, Russia moving uh, more again into a more confrontational relationship with the West and are using that uh, uh, incident in Salisbury to be able to influence the course of uh, where Russian policy is going after the elections. As Russia and the West come close to direct confrontation in Syria, dealing with a man who's willing to tear up the international rule book to achieve his goals is one thing. Dealing with a man who might be losing control to powerful warring factions is quite another. 